Hey, welcome back to another episode of GSA Does That, the podcast that uncovers the stories behind the federal agency delivering effective and efficient government. I'm your host, Rob Trubia, and today in our seventh episode, we're talking about a topic that sparks both curiosity and fascination, lighthouses. Have you ever peered across the coastline and wondered what it might just be like to own your own lighthouse? Or perhaps you find yourself drawn to their historical significance and timeless beauty. Well, if you share our passion for lighthouses, then this is an episode you don't want to miss. Join us as we set sail with the guests that have the knowledge to make your dreams come true and make sure you know just what you might be getting yourself into. Today, we're privileged to have John Kelly, the GSA New England Regional Director of Real Property Disposition. John's an expert regarding the intricate process of purchasing a lighthouse from the federal government. We're also thrilled to have Matthew Stuck, a waterways manager with the U.S. Coast Guard, who will share insights into the vital role lighthouses have played in maritime history and their significance in today's world. And as a bonus, you'll hear a clip from a special episode we're also publishing with guest Sheila Consul, the proud owner of Fairport Harbor West Lighthouse on Lake Erie. And here's why Sheila thinks buying a lighthouse is absolutely worth it. Sheila, you have committed a ton of hours, years really, into renovating your lighthouse on top of the financial commitment. When you add it all up, what makes it worth it to you? Oh, they're magnificent. I mean, there's nothing like them. They are so unique. They are so beloved. They're just magnificent structures. If you come to visit mine, one of the things that people are most surprised about is how well built it is. Mine was built in a factory in Buffalo, New York in the early 1900s, 1920s. It's got foot thick walls. It's made of steel. It came down Lake Erie in a boat. It was raised by a crane. It put on the platform that it sits on now, almost a hundred years ago. The fact that that kind of engineering and that kind of construction, you know, was done, you don't, we don't do that today. I mean, we can't afford it. People don't know how to do it. Some of the uh, beams inside, there's a chain winch that's really interesting. Uh, just amazing pieces. This The cast iron circular staircase is just gorgeous. It runs up three flights of stairs. You don't see those anymore. People don't make those. People can't construct them. Um, so we have to save all these lighthouses. We have to. They're not being built anymore. And so if you have the passion, you have the time, you have the perseverance, and you have some extra resources, I would say go for it. So happy that GSA puts so much thought and effort into what to do with these lighthouses um, and really provide an opportunity to have them saved and continued and restored because so many historic buildings just get torn down, and that's very, very sad. So whether you're a lighthouse enthusiast, a history buff, or simply curious about the possibilities that lie within the world of lighthouses, this episode is made for you. Tune in and prepare to be enlightened on just how the lighthouse program works and how you or your community preservation group could find yourselves with the keys to your very own lighthouse. And remember, this podcast is available on all major platforms, so please be sure to subscribe. For more information about this episode and others, visit us online at gsa.gov slash podcast. Matt, I know you've spent years on the water. What do lighthouses mean to you as a mariner, and what do you think the allure is to so many? Yeah, so uh, so the history is broad and deep, right? Um, lighthouses are part and parcel to the development of our country as a seagoing nation. I mean, to this day, 95% of the commerce that comes uh, to and from the United States does so by water, right? So that started early on uh, during Western settlement uh, as Europeans came here and, and others uh, migrated. And one of the first orders of business was not running ships aground. And it was critical to make sure that we had the right kinds of structures in place to to mark headlands, both in ways that would cause mariners to avoid it and uh, navigate safely around those hazards. And then conversely to say, come to me, this is port X, this is port Y, this is port Z. So that uh, the days of sailing, you could essentially uh, go north or south along the entire East Coast and 
You could le look left or look right, depending on your direction. You'd say, I am passing Boston. I am passing Portland. I am passing Chesapeake Bay and, and so forth. Um, and so that really became the, the framework of, of the, uh, the earliest uh, aids to navigation system that the country has. Um, the first uh, ever fixed aid uh, that was built was here at Boston Light. Uh, off of Little Brewster Island uh, in the Boston Harbor approaches. And that was back in, uh, oh gosh, 1716. And that uh, was the site of a Revolutionary War battle. The original structure had been burned down by the British. It had been rebuilt. And, and actually, it's pertinent because that very lighthouse structure now is in the process of transfer through the National uh, Lighthouse Historic Preservation uh, Act through GSA. I can tell you that that for, for my own experience, it it is comforting to see uh, a, a light knowing that, you know, 12 miles away, 16 miles away, uh, that's Portland. I, as I move around, as I do my job offshore, the uh, Coast Guard law enforcement, Coast Guard aids navigation programs, you, you know in relative terms how far and where you're at just by looking up and seeing these, these, uh, these lights offshore. And so they still, have a, they still have a place today despite the advent of a whole series of electronics. Uh, that we all appreciate as mariners uh, is still a super dangerous place, right? People often don't realize how truly potentially unsafe life at sea can be for the unprepared. And uh, and the lighthouse structures are really part of that that whole, you know, uh, uh, support system. It's my understanding it's the National Historic Lighthouse Preservation Act of 2000 makes all this possible, sale transfer to nonprofits, to individuals. Can you give us, John, a brief overview of the Lighthouse Preservation Act? There were several drivers. Uh, Matt mentioned some of the techno technological advances, um, like GPS, and also solar power that allowed the lights to you know, run on batteries. Didn't require people to be in there you know, feeding the oil into the lantern and making sure that it was constantly light liking. It no longer required the demand for the Coast Guard to provide the eight navigation. As a result, uh, Coast Guard licensed many lighthouses to local nonprofit community groups in an effort to reduce their holding costs and allow for some effective use of these were essentially vacant properties. Many regard the very mutually beneficial arrangement. However, um, prior to the NHLPA, uh, nonprofit organizations had little or no standing to acquire lighthouses under the traditional uh, disposal process, which is very unfortunate because many of these groups uh, community and preservation right, invested significant capital and sweat equity to restore or maintain these assets uh, during the license player period. And if Coast Guard decided to dispose of the lights, which was beginning to happen on a more regular basis, these groups had no way of benefiting. So to address this issue and to acknowledge the significant role lighthouses played in American history, uh, Congress passed the National Historic Lighthouse Preservation Act of 2000, commonly referred to as the NHLPA. It's very important that the Congress decided to amend the National Historic Preservation Act of 1966, not the traditional Property Act disposition process, again, highlighting the importance of preserving these uh, landmarks in perpetuity. The NHLPA recognizes the significance of the historic lighthouses uh, for maritime traffic, coastal communities, not-for-profit organizations, and lighthouse enthusiasts. It gives priorities to public bodies and nonprofit corporations to acquire a historic lighthouse at no cost through a competitive merit-based application process. Goal is to convey the lighthouses to new loan owners who will preserve their historic, cultural, recreational, and educational value in perpetuity. Uh, the program is a longstanding partnership amongst the Coast Guard, National Park Service, and GSA. Uh, under the NHLPA, lighthouses may be transferred at no cost. Federal agencies, state and local governments, nonprofit corporations, educational agencies, and community development organizations. The entities must agree to comply with conditions sent fo set forth in the bill. And uh, number one, be financially able to maintain a historic lighthouse. I'm sure, as many of you know, uh, a free lighthouse is not a cheap lighthouse. Um, it comes with significant burdens and a way of cost. Uh, the entity uh, must also make the property available to the general public at reasonable times under reasonable conditions. And if the eligible entity is not identified, uh, the NHLPA does authorize GSA to conduct a competitive sale of the lighthouse, which is typically done through an online auction. If so, uh, the restrictions are generally limited to historic preservation only, and the new owner is not compelled to require uh, public access, although many often do. No, that's that's helpful. And I'm curious, Matt, is it the Coast Guard that decides this is a lighthouse we no longer need? What do you do? You contact GSA and say, hey, we want to sell this. We don't want it anymore. How does it work? 
Yeah. So as, as John was, uh, was saying at the beginning, one of the ways that, that the Coast Guard makes a determination about whether or not the, the property is uh, overhead value, its costs, um, its, uh, its desire, the service's desire to make sure that that property is adequately maintained. I mean, there's 780, give or take, lighthouses nationwide that, are, that we might consider to be historic uh, lighthouses. Um, John mentioned the number of that are in Michigan alone. Uh, we have about 220 or so here in the northern New Jersey, New York, and New England area. Given the type of, frankly, high quality construction, ingenuity, um, various and diverse architectural styles over basically a century and a half, two centuries, there's a lot of overhead that comes with those. Entire families were needed to take care of them. They came with light keepers quarters, sometimes assistant keepers and light keepers quarters. And that really uh, drove uh, cisterns, generators, uh, I mean, all kinds of, as technology evolved, you know, the opportunity and the expertise required by the light keepers also evolved until we really got to a tipping point at which we could build structures with uh, with galvanized steel, with, uh, with essentially um, skeletal uh, structures, um, platforms on top, guy wires, and and frankly, make them easier to maintain, less expensive to construct in the first place. Uh, and and you overlay that with the advent of uh, light emitting diode LED technology, right? Where now the lamps don't even have to get changed with the same type of frequency that they did back in the day. Forget about whale oil, forget about diesel fuel and kerosene, forget about like, we're just like really moving forward now. And now we have self-contained lights with lithium batteries and solar panels and and are at, in many cases almost as bright or brighter than some of the beautiful Fresnels and, and these other artifacts that the Coast Guard had used for a long time to to mark these headlands. Uh, technology was helpful. The overhead was was massive and has been massive. And it's not right to have these properties be fallow for too long, particularly for an organization like the Coast Guard that you know, post 9-11 in particular has just uh, taken on a whole series of other mission areas outside of the, of maritime uh, transportation safety, which is still one of our top priorities. But but we have so many other roles now as well. And the coastline hasn't grown very much. So, so it comes time to make difficult de- decisions and choices about the value of that property, how else the Coast Guard might use it. Does it need for housing? Does it need... And once we made that determination through the real estate uh, program leaders on the civil engineering side of the Coast Guard, um, that's when they will reach out once, once a, an operational commander said, I don't think we need this property anymore. We need the light. We need the sound signal. We need the emergency light, but we don't need the property anymore. Let's get a hold of our, uh, our engineering team and they'll work with our friends at GSA. Yeah, that's interesting. It seems like it's a win-win for the government because I think what you're saying, and correct me if I'm wrong, is you relinquish ownership of the actual structure of the lighthouse. You don't no longer have to maintain it. But you actually still get the use of the lamp of the beacon. That's right. Yeah, the beacon, the 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 essential need of whether or not a sound signal is critical, whether or not a primary optic or a backup light is is essential. Uh, the range and distance at which it needs to project over the water, um, the kind of stakeholders that are going to be using that. That's a, a, a very separate process, right? That deals with the local notice to mariners. That deals with with the very regimented public outreach and engagement process before we make operational decisions about the navigation infrastructure. How we give those signals to the public is, uh, is we can be done a lot of different ways. So we definitely treat them as separate questions. And as a result, we always maintain the appropriate easements and uh, responsibilities that uh, the GSA supports when they write deeds and they conduct that, that transfer. So John, if what does it look like when you're selling, let's just say this is going to an individual, or I guess it could be to a nonprofit. When GSA is conducting this transaction, taking care of all these details, part of the contract must be, hey, we have an easement, the government can still come on. How does that all work? Do they have to make an appointment? Do they have to let you know they're coming? Do they can show up whenever they need? What's that What's that cooperation look like between the new owner and the government? Well, it was not said. I mean, critical to the demands. If the if the eighth navigation remains active, that is our primary concern. That we did not do anything to interfere with the ability for the Coast Guard to deliver that mission. So we retain whatever rights are necessary to allow the Coast Guard. Uh, I mean, they'll give notice when reasonable. But if it's an emergency situation, they have to go fix the light, and they're, they're going to have to go fix the light. Um, that's part and parcel of the expectation of the program. We communicate that to all potential uh, 
either bid or through a public sale or through that no cost conveyance that is clearly uh, understood by all. So John, my understanding is there's three primary agencies when it comes to lighthouse transfer. You know, you've got the Coast Guard, we're talking to Matt about that. Then you got the National Park Service and GSA. Can you tell us what is each one of their roles and particularly maybe expound a little bit on GSA? Sure, absolutely. Happy to do so. Uh, it's been a very successful partnership. Uh, we've enjoyed a significant level of cooperation, coordination, and communication between all three agencies, which I think is a significant factor in the partnership success. From a GSA perspective, you know, we, we basically act as a real estate broker. We facilitate the transfer of the lighthouse from the Coast Guard to the new owner. In that role, uh, we'll review the title and other real estate due diligence information provided by the Coast Guard, which can be fascinating. Matt mentioned the Fox and Harbor light. I believe that light was commissioned by uh, George Washington or, 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 or John Adams. I mean, these lighthouses go back to the beginning of the country. So you're going back, you're looking through deeds and title documents that come from the king. Uh, it, it can be rather fascinating. For anyone who's real estate, uh, you'll find yourself going down rabbit trails after rabbit trails looking at some of these uh, lighthouse uh, title documents. Once we're satisfied, we have sufficient information and we can describe what we're, what we're the asset and what are restrictions or other, other considerations that need to be taken into account by a new owner, we would announce uh, the availability of the lighthouse by issuing a notice of availability. Uh, we would then organize site inspections for interested parties, come out and put boots on the ground and take a look at the light and get a better understanding of what it is they could possibly be taking on. Uh, we would develop sale terms and conditions and, and manage the competitive sale if the Park Service does not make a selection for a no-cost applicant. Uh, we also have the role of executing all the real estate conveyance documents. So we we sign deeds, we sign uh, you know we'll, we'll grant easements. Um, we also you know cooperate with the National Park Service to 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 address any non-compliance issues that may arise after a no-cost conveyance. So um, as we go down the Coast Guard, I think Matt did a great job describing their role. They determine which lighthouse they no longer need to own to execute the eighth navigation mission. The National Park Service. Um, typically playing on their their core expertise. They determine the uh, application criteria for a no cost transfer. They provide the application to eligible entities. They review all applications. And if they approve an application, they formally request the GSA to convey the light to a selected entity. They also have a very important role of monitoring the lighthouse post conveyance to ensure our compliance uh, with the approved application. So it really is a, a partnership with each organization as John, who decides if a lighthouse is not going to go uh, for free to a nonprofit, an agency, or you know, a local town? If it's going to go to a individual, who decides what it what it sells for? Does GSA put a price on that? We wouldn't run it through an auction process. I think anyone who's involved with a lighthouse is uh, very difficult to find a comparable property. Uh, you know, you take Boston Harbor Light. I'm not sure how you would even ask an appraiser to go out there and put a value. I'm sure they'd be happy to, you know take your money and give you a value. But at the end of the day, we look for the market to decide. We believe we've got robust bidding during the auction process. And and it, we feel that that's probably the best indicator of value. And is this a particularly active year for lighthouses? It seems like it might be. It's been a very active year, perhaps the uh, busiest to date. Um, in large part, uh, due to the extensive media coverage this program has received uh, locally, regionally, nationally and internationally. We've had calls from all over the world coming in. It just seems that this, it really demonstrates a broad level of interest that continues in these historic landmarks. Um, it always amazes me the amount of interest in people have in lighthouse, even folks from Kansas who may never have seen a lighthouse that they like, they still seem to have some attraction, uh, romantic nature of the lighthouse. So in May of this year, uh, GSA issued notices for six historic lighthouses in five states. As I mentioned earlier, the notice informs the public about the opportunity to acquire the lighthouse at no cost. And uh, the, it would, interested parties were provided 60 days for the date of that NOAA to express interest in acquiring a lighthouse. Um, those lighthouses included the Lynn Point Lighthouse in Old Saybrook and the uh, Amlet of Senwick, uh, Connecticut, uh, the Knobsco Lighthouse, which is on the Falmouth uh, Road Race in Woods Hole, Massachusetts, uh, the Gurnett Lighthouse in, in Plymouth, Massachusetts. Warwick Neck Light uh, in scenic Warwick, Rhode Island, and the Little Mark Island at Monument, Hartsville, Maine. And then, dare I deviate from the New England theme here, we're going out to Erie Harbor, New York Pier Lighthouse in Erie, Pennsylvania. Those are all lighthouses being mail and being available at no cost. As I mentioned earlier, where the Park Service will have the primary role in deciding whether or not an applicant is suitable for a no cost transfer. 
They've all generated significant interest, and uh, the Arc Service has provided applications, or will be providing applications to a number of interested parties. And over the next few months, they will be reviewing those applications, and if they prove an application, they will request the GSA to transfer the property to that entity. Are there a couple of uh, lighthouses as well on Long Island Sound? Yeah, we're actually uh, offering the following lighthouses for sale by online auction. They've gone through the NOAA process with no applicants being selected by the Department of Interior. So we're offering for sale the Penfield Reef Lighthouse in Fairfield, Connecticut, which is in Long Island Sound, Stratton Shoal Light, and East Setucket, New York, uh, both within uh, the Long Island Sound area. And then we're also rocking the Cleveland Harbor West Pierhead Light in Cleveland, Ohio, and the Keweenaw Waterway Lower Entrance Light in Chazelle, Michigan. Those are all off for sale uh, via online auction. Wow. Matt, why is it such an active year? Do you know? I mean, is there is the Coast Guard going, hey, it's time to get rid of some of these? Yeah, Rob. I, I um, The way that John was explaining the process, it, it made me, you know, sort of include some of the realities of what we face. So even the lighthouses themselves, based on their location, whether they're on water, abutting water, they have large piece of property or not, are often very desirable for agency partners to pick up very quickly because it dovetails very well with their missions. National Park Service is a great example. A lot of state agencies that deal with uh, with recreation, with uh, with um, preservation of the environment, um, and the location of these properties, the uh, the idea that there's there's buildings, there's plumbing, there's electrical, there's there's things that that work effectively for them to be able to stage their teams to to execute their mission even as the Coast Guard continues to to perform its navigation safety mission. I think makes a lot of them very desirable. They get taken quickly. They never show up to public auction. I think over time, some of them that are maybe more remote um, or more challenging to reach, um, those are uh, may often come up for sale uh, because it, they don't dovetail sort of naturally with the mission of a local stakeholder or partner. Um, they don't benefit from a natural friends type group, preservation type group. Uh, a lot of our lighthouses, I mean, you know, out of the 200 some odd that are just in the first district um, up here in the extreme Northeast, we have um, the majority of them on the National uh, Register of Historic Places. Um, there's 12 lighthouses that are actually national historic landmarks, including Boston Light, Montauk Point Light, and, and some others just in our neck of the woods. Well, those ones really do go a little more quickly because of their location or, or because they, uh, they again, have natural connection to these other groups. And then as you go down that list, some of them are very difficult to access. And now uh, that's where it becomes more challenging, I think. And that's when you, you, you sort of get down to that sale piece and, um, you know, and I'd let, you know, John, I don't know if I characterize that completely correctly, but, but, uh, you know, it, it seems just from kind of outside of looking in as, as we've been dealing with our properties for a while, that, that, that's kind of a natural outcome of all this. Yeah, I think you're absolutely right. I think some of the more desirable lights, the land-based lights certainly have had, um, far more likely to go at no cost than through a public sale and some are offshore lights that are far more challenging as far as access, seasonality of uh, getting out to it. Um, tend to go which was a sale. So will all lighthouses eventually be no longer owned by the government? I mean, Matt, does the Coast Guard say we're never letting that one go? We're never letting that one go? Or eventually are they all going to be going to GSA to be sold? Yeah, so that's a good that's a good question, Rob. You know, again, a lot of it depends on the Coast Guard's organic use of the property itself. We have uh, lighthouses that abut Coast Guard stations, um, that abut uh, moorings for Coast Guard cutters that might serve as government housing for Coast Guard families. So there are a lot of uh, uh, ways in which the Coast Guard need out for its people, for its other missions outside of just providing a signal to mariners uh, will cause us to retain a property for a while. We, it's definitely not something that we do lightly in any way, shape or form. In fact, if anything, we probably spend a lot more time sort of going back and forth and looking at the different arguments as to why we should keep it, why we should we should recommend it for divestiture through uh, NHLPA. Then, then maybe we should all the time. We do that because we we want to make sure we're getting the answer right. I do think that that what is clear is that we can, due to technology, produce uh, and and construct light structures, towers, ranges um, that are that are bright. They're capable. They're efficient. They're inexpensive. 
they're most definitely not nostalgic. They don't fit the mold. Uh, they're not nostalgic, right? So they fit the mold. They fit the mold. Uh, they don't fit the mold of, of America's castles, right? I mean, you can really think of the modern of the uh, of the lighthouse of the last uh, couple centuries as, and and this is very much the way preservation groups view it, as they should, because they are uh, they're unique and they're precious, and they're some of the earliest signs of ingenuity. Um, by a very young country that was trying to move itself forward. And um, and so the nostalgia is real. Uh, the nav safety importance is still real. Um, but when we build them now, <laughs> we do so with the long view in mind and we leverage pretty much every aspect of, of uh, civil engineering and marine engineering we can get our hands on. John, what are what are some success stories that you've seen with, with good sales, whether they've been to a uh, preservation group or to an individual. Can you share any stories with us that it's just been, it really worked out well and it's really exciting to see what's happened to the lighthouse. But you know, when I first got on the call, Matt was mentioning Gatehead. I certainly think that was a tremendous example of um, how the lighthouse bill was very helpful. On Mott's admitted, it was conveyed to a local partnership between the town of Aquinnah and a nonprofit preservation group. Uh, Real success story. The lighthouse was situated along an eroding shoreline and that threatened the long term stability of the, the conical tower. The, the town and its partners uh, they embarked on a multi year effort uh, to acquire the light and then ultimately fund its multi million dollar relocation away from the cliffs. And as a result, it remains an activated navigation today and is, and is a top tourist des- destination on the island. I think, Matt, uh, I know you were very much involved in that and we had a number of folks uh, involved, but they had a it went on for years. They had campaigns, they had marathons, they were running any number of things, bake sales, generate funds for this. And it really became one of the most exciting things happening on Martha's Vineyard at the time. But you just sense of how important the lighthouse is not only to the local community, but the overall island is as well, the tourist space. Uh, and I guess at the risk of appearing uh, partial to New England lighthouses, which I, I am, I think the offshore New L- London ledge light was also a success story. It's a beautiful and distinct lighthouse square brick building with a mansard roof uh, in a circle of lantern room, not the typical conical tower so many associate with lighthouses. It's conveyed at no cost to the uh, New London Maritime Museum, uh, who actually worked with other nonprofit organizations to showcase that lighthouse, but also taking advantage of its strategic location uh, within a few miles of probably another half dozen lighthouses. So they, they work together with other groups, uh, split cost, and they offer interpretive tours on a regular basis to the public and uh, local school children. Uh, you mentioned sales. Um, from a sales perspective, again, staying in New England, I, I think the Graves Lighthouse. Uh, Perilous Light, located nine miles from Boston on the outermost island in Boston Harbor, stands about a 113 feet high, big granite block. It marks the entrance to the North Channel. Probably the first thing Mariners would see as they approach Boston Harbor coming in. It was sold in 2013 uh, via the online auction. And the high bid exceeded $900,000, uh, one of the highest amounts paid for a lighthouse today. It was bought by a local couple, which we love when locals buy it, who made substantial improvement and they use it as a family getaway. So I uh, certainly knew online and researched that. It's fascinating. They've uh, documented all the improvements it made. And I'm back to Connecticut. Uh, final line, I guess I would talk from a sale perspective, was the uh, Sabre Breakwater Lighthouse. It was sold uh, online auction in 2015. It's the lighthouse that's prominently featured on the Connecticut license plates. If you ever go through Connecticut, you see a lighthouse on a lighthouse on the SUV license plate. It is a Sabre Breakwater light, about 48 feet in height, and it's over 135 years old. What do you tell John? What do you tell people that are seriously at that point where they're about to make that final decision to write that check? Is there a buyer beware? What, What kind of advice do you have for potential owners? Understand that you're taking on what many may see as a liability. Um, and there's a romantic notion of lighthouses, but as Matt has alluded to, there's a significant capital requirement to maintain these lighthouses in a safe manner. So we always caution them to bring out experts. We, we encourage them when they come out for a site inspection to bring architects, to bring professionals who can speak and understand what they possibly get themselves involved in. When a lighthouse goes up for auction, how much time are we looking at from when you maybe put your first bid in to when you get the keys? I would say probably about 120 days. You know, usually the, the, it's coming up at the eBay auction. The bidding activity is determined as the close day. So for a very popular light, it could it could go on for months. Uh, for a less popular light, it could it could close in 30 days. Wow, that's pretty quick, quicker than I thought. Yeah, yeah, that's it's really neat. It's a 
it's a really neat partnership, not just between the government agencies, but between the the towns, the different historic preservation societies, individuals. It sounds like everyone's getting together. Everyone believes they're beautiful. Everyone thinks they're just captivating and they want to see them preserved. That's and right. So, you know, I mean, whether you're in the Coast Guard or just somebody that lives in that area or you're visiting, they're just, they're really beautiful. I mean, you talked about 780 in, in the country and we've had how many, John? 150 have been sold. 150 under the, the uh, current NHLPA. I mean, prior to the NHLPA, there were there were other in- initiatives up in Maine. Okay. The lights program. Maybe was there a dozen lights, Matt? Correct me if I'm wrong. Thereabouts. Right about. Yep. Yeah. And, and I know uh, prior to that, uh, lighthouses would come in to report the excess, like other other property. And again, not affording nonprofit standing. And I really want to echo Matt's point: the nonprofit community was probably the largest driver of getting this bill done. Uh, they were really forceful and getting to Congress and lobbying on, on behalf of the nonprofits because they really had no standing. And yet they were making all these investments and their heart was in the right place. But at the end of the day, if Coast Guard accessed that property, reported the GSA, we would have no ability to reward or acknowledge all the work they'd done up until that point. So this bill really does create an equal playing field, unlike the traditional property act process that would afford a special standing to the feds or to a, to a state or to a local community over a nonprofit, nonprofits can compete equally with these entities, which is a a real departure from the normal disposal process. Again, playing on a preservation uh, goal of the bill, not about making money, not about dumping properties, it's about finding the way to position these properties for long-term preservation. It's neat. It's, I think people just really care. They really care about these structures. They want to see them preserved. So John, before we close out, where do our listeners find lighthouses listed for sale by GSA. I'd be remiss not to advertise our real estate sales.gov page, which any interested listeners are interested in seeking lighthouses or other properties GSA has for sale. I'd recommend uh, they visit that website and they'll the listing of the four lighthouses I mentioned as, as well as other properties GSA is currently offering. Great. What what is that URL, John? Real real estate sales.gov. Thank you both. I really appreciate it. It was a great conversation. Uh, I really sense a, some real passion for lighthouses from both of you. It's not just a job. It's really very much a mission, which I think is great. And it's just neat to see something that so many people get behind. Really, I've never met anybody that didn't think they were beautiful structures, that they weren't captivating, that they weren't fascinating. And that brings us to the end of this conversation on GSA Does That. We hope you enjoyed our time with GSA's John Kelly and U.S. Coast Guard Representative Matthew Stock. Throughout this episode, we've learned about the fascinating history and significance of lighthouses, how they're managed and preserved through the National Historic Lighthouse Preservation Act, and the incredible opportunities available to those who dream of owning one of their very own. From guiding sailors through treacherous waters to standing as symbols of resilience and hope, lighthouses hold a special place in the hearts of many. Hey, and if you enjoyed what you heard today, don't forget to check out our bonus episode where we continue the conversation with lighthouse owner Sheila Consul, the owner of Fairport Harbor West Lighthouse. Sheila shares her inspiring story and offers tips and advice for those of you who might be dreaming of owning a piece of America's nautical heritage. Hey, if you enjoyed this episode, please be sure to subscribe to GSA Does That. And for more information, visit gsa.gov slash podcast. Or to suggest a topic or host, send us an email at gsa does that at gsa.gov. I'm your host, Rob Trivia. Our executive producer is the one and only Max Stempora. GSA Does That is a production of the U.S. General Services Administration Office of Strategic Communication. 